Hi guys, Kellen and I spend all of our time trying to figure out how to navigate complicated cannabis challenges. Today, we are excited to bring to you a solution for your accounting needs. Navigating 280E, keeping clean books, and providing financial and accounting advice is a massive headache for so many businesses. End to End is a team of CPAs with backgrounds from the big public firms that specialize in the cannabis industry. End to End is offering a no-cost consultation if you tell them the dime sent you. That's right, free accounting advice. Go to n2nadvisors.com now to take advantage of this. That's n, the number 2, n, a, d, v, i, s, o, r, s.com to get free accounting advice now. This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Dime. This week, we have a special guest, Hans Schulfer, and we're talking about growing cannabis. Hans, welcome to The Dime. Thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing real good. Hi, Kellen. Hi, Brian. Good to talk to you guys again. It's been a while. I'm excited to do the show. Awesome. Awesome. So I think for our listeners, it might be best for you to kind of describe your role in the space, kind of what you're doing now and, and kind of how you fell into this role and what got you started in the cannabis industry. Sure. Um, well, like most people, I've been pseudo involved for a long, long time, but uh, uh, we had a bunch of friends who are up in the Humboldt area who grew medical cannabis for a long time. Um, and about eight or nine years ago I joined them um, ran a nursery and some smaller grows up there and then right when Washington went legal we moved up here and built a tier three greenhouse outdoor you know greenhouse mixed light outdoor farm Um, and I operated that for two years then we expanded to a couple more outdoor farms long story short got kicked out for political reasons and now we operate the uh, single largest outdoor grow in Washington Um, and we are expanding into an indoor space here and into a couple down in California. Can you just quickly tell the difference, George, communicate the difference between cannabis from an indoor standpoint and outdoor standpoint and kind of how an end customer can understand the variations in the flower? Can you just kind of describe lightly how the differences in where it's grown can really make a difference? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, obviously the biggest factor with indoor is you control everything, right? So um, outdoors, you're essentially farming. Um, but for example, two seasons ago, we got an early winter and it was basically just a panic um, dumpster fire to get everything harvested before everything turned into rot. So everything was a little preemie, blah, blah, blah. We extract all of it so it didn't make a difference. But uh, inside, it's total control. It's like a lab. Um, you can control perfect temperature, your CO2 usage at the right times. Um, you know, you can control how many times a day you feed them, how quickly they dry out, what medium you're using. Um, it's a lot easier to get your uh, beneficial sprays on, your pest management. Obviously, it's just having total control over every little aspect. Just it makes for a higher quality flower. It makes it just kind of more um, more predictable, I guess, would be the way to really put it the biggest variables outside besides just weather um as far as like you know freezing or anything is uh we have trouble even if it's just a little cold obviously when you're flowering you want to be able to push as much food into the plant as possible um that's what's going to push out your terpenes your thc levels and your yields your weight and outside if it's a little cold in august or if it's just rainy or it's wet i can't feed so it just kind of you know, inside, it's just you keep your temperature perfect, you keep everything perfect, and you're feeding two, three, four times a day, whatever you want to do, and you just get everything dialed in and perfect. So it just makes a better flower and everything more consistent. Yeah, I think the predictable standpoint is a unique aspect, and it's not one I think is commonly understood. So, Kellen, when you go to a dispensary and you're going to select a flower, do you ask whether it's indoor or outdoor? So I'm in Colorado, and... The majority, it's a lot colder in Colorado, right? It snows, there's mountains and stuff, right? (laughs) Um, And so the dispensaries in Colorado tend to only have indoor flower, right? So um, I think Hans mentioned uh, about two years ago when they had the frost or whatnot, and they were uh, a lot of their outdoor material just gets turned into oil. And I think that's the same way in Colorado. Um, I know there's one really large farm down kind of by the Pueblo area in Colorado, but um, they've actually been decimated the last two years because of early snow, right? So the majority of cannabis in Colorado is indoor cannabis, and that would be the majority of cannabis you see on the shelves. And 
I honestly think that that is the case across the country. Um, would you agree, Hans, that most retail cannabis that you're buying these days in the dispensary is indoor cannabis? Yeah, definitely. I, in, in Washington, for sure, um, they people kind of have a stigma where they only want to buy uh, indoors anyway. And it, it, it's somewhat unfair because you can grow really good weed outside. It's just, you know, but, but I get it. Uh, but in uh, California, it seems a little bit different. They don't seem to care where it was grown. Um, and obviously, it, once you get into like central Southern California, um, you know, Santa Barbara area and stuff, you can, the, <clears throat> that desert, as long as you have enough water, you don't worry about it so much like the early freeze or the temperature. So you can grow some really good wheat out there. But definitely for the most part, it is pretty much consensus that the best weed is going to be grown inside. So people definitely pay more for it. That's for sure. So that, that the only place I've ever really seen a lot of outdoor greenhouse weed in flower form on the shelf is probably, you know, central Southern California. What about Florida? Uh, Florida is going to be all indoor. Um, at least for now, it's too humid. Um, I, I, again, I've never grown in the swamp, uh, so I'd have to try it before I could really, you know, a hundred percent say like what would happen, but from everything, like the knowledge I have and everything, it would probably, I just think it'd be a disaster. It'd be so humid and so hot. Um, the, the buds would probably just rot on you, um, come August. So, uh, I, I think 95 to a hundred percent, everything down there is just going to be either indoor or completely temperature, humidity controlled greenhouses. Yeah. And I think that makes sense, especially as brands want to create a predictable, repeatable product, especially across state lines, they're going to need to have a consistency. And the best way to have a consistent product is to, is to control all your variables. So I think that makes a ton of sense. I think uh, like Arizona, Nevada, um, you could probably grow like really well outside. Uh, the problem they have is water. So it's, um, inside same thing you can kind of there's all kinds of things you can do you can collect water from your dehumidifiers and fill up your tanks and stuff like that um you can recycle it all that stuff when you're growing outside it, you can't so it's i mean i'll use on our farms up here I'll, I'll use eight million gallons in a summer so it's like if you can't have access to that water you just can't do it so there's there's that variable too but i do think if you put an outdoor farm in I, somewhere where it's just nice and hot in Nevada or Arizona, as long as the solar path is right, um, you could probably grow some of the best weed on the planet, in my opinion. Um, I'm skewed because I like outdoor weed, but you know, anyway. Can you tell when you, if you grab the, like, if we put three different flowers in front of you, could you tell which one was outdoor, which one would be indoor? Ooh, that depends. Um, <laughs> it depends on <laughs> how, uh, how good your outdoor growers were. It's, uh, I, if, if you got a really good outdoor grower and they have a good season, um, I, I'd be able to tell it wasn't indoors, I think, but I could, I would probably say it was greenhouse. I mean, I've shown some of our weed to people and they're like, Oh, that's indoors. And I say, no, it's outdoors. And then they argue with me. Um, and I'm like, I literally grew it, but okay. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I mean, it, it, it can, it can, it, and it also depends. I've seen people's indoor weed that I say, Oh, that's our outdoor. Like, did it mold? So it just kind of, it really, that is a question for the grower, uh, uh, more of a less specific answer, probably 90% of the time. Yes. I'd be able to at least tell whether it was greenhouse, outdoor or indoor. Indoor usually has a pretty distinct look to it. Um, but again, I, it kind of depends on if, if it was all equally quality grown, then you, you, you'd be able to have a pretty good idea for the most part. Yeah. That, that would be an exciting Netflix reality show. I know, right? Some weed sommeliers. So with, with growers, do you have a specific kind of style or like for, for certain chefs, for example, they want to cook a certain way for you growing the cannabis? Do you kind of lean in certain directions or do you have a preferred style that kind of is more to, to you? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously everybody, the, the, what we always used to say, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? Kellen, you remember Jesse, that was his thing. Um, mainly it just kind of comes with little stuff like, um, topping a plant or some people don't like to top different genetics. And, um, personally I have one way across the board. We do everything just cause as you start to scale, it becomes less boutique and you kind of just have to be able to train people to do it in a, in a quick and cost effective way that also produces the best yields quality and lowest cost right so we have a, a specifically prune for instance that um i was in a, a fight with not a fist fight but like a yelling match with some guys in california about they didn't like the way i prune and they prune a different way i don't like the way they prune you know <laughs> so it's uh they, it, it all just kind of depends on the way you do it uh 
I will say the way they're doing it's wrong and their yields reflected it, but that's a different story. Um, I, we, the, we'll usually, we do what we call lollipopping where we just, we take everything off the plant about week one of flower up until the top two or three little nodes of growth. So the thing looks naked, people look at it and they freak out and that's wrong. You can't do it. But um, we, we do it simply because I only have time to go through and do it once. So we do it once and that's that. And then the plant grows out of it and it, it, it focuses all the growth to the top so you get those big colas instead of having a bunch of larfy stuff underneath underneath in the bottom so i mean that's one thing uh other than that i mean feeding is pretty pretty straightforward certain people have different just like feeding lines that they want to use um heavy 16 or general hydroponics or stuff like that um i work with a nutrient company and we kind of develop it as we go you know it, it really I, I don't it's tough to answer whether or not there's like a, just a full style you know what i mean it, but it, there's just definitely little little tweaks and quirks that everybody kind of does differently um what about you know uh, outdoor yeah. sure there's that um again the basically mediums if you're all right so if you're going inside certain people like to use rock wool like to use cocoa some people like to use soil uh, some people like to grow organically um so outside you can go into the ground you can go into a pot um we have both out here if i was going to grow organically personally i would have to do like top dressing just dry amendments um whereas inside if you want to grow organically you can use a liquid organic nutrient um so I don't know. I mean, how, how can I specify it more, I guess, would be the question. Um, it's it, the, the organic versus salt is pretty much as simple as this. Organically, the plant, you, you feed the soil, right? So you feed the soil, you get all the bacteria and the fungus uh, propagating. It eats the, the nutrients, does its thing. The plant takes up the waste. That's kind of like the easiest way to put it. With the salt, you're essentially just feeding the plant directly. So you can... It kind of like the indoor outdoor thing i can really pinpoint if i'm feeding with a salt what i want to give it at a certain time <laughs> um, and as long as the problem with salt is you can burn them if you give them too much so uh, that really just comes down to a uh, i guess a preference i personally would prefer to grow organically but it's just a little harder to do it to scale but I, it does put out better taste and stuff like that whereas i think you can get higher thc contents if you grow salts so um does that answer your question or am I just rambling? No, that answers my question. And I guess to take it one step further, these characteristics that you're describing, the end consumer obviously is is not going to be able to know the all of these intricate things, but where, like, how could, how do they make these selection differences? Obviously, you're talking about how one aspect can influence the plant one way and one the other. So if they go into a dispensary, are the bud tenders going to know this? Can can a consumer ask the bud tenders? Do you have any ideas about how that would work? In my experience with bud tenders, no. Um, they don't know much more than, what's up, brah? Like, here's to check this weed out. Um, but <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> I suppose <laughs> if, you know, you you did like a really, you know, hardcore, uh, it'd be uh, maybe one day it'll be like when you go into a fancy restaurant and they have the sommelier come out and tell you about the, the where the grapes came from and how they grew them. Um, right now, I've never experienced that in cannabis. Um, it, it's just kind of a kid behind the register telling you what he likes, but they'll tell you whether or not it's organic. Um, but then again, uh, can you really prove whether or not the, uh, that we can't do any federal like uh, like Omri listed or anything. They won't do any of that for cannabis because it's not federally legal. So pretty much, I could just say it's organic if I wanted to, and like you can come prove it, you know. So that, that's kind of. I don't think the industry is really there yet, to be honest with you. No, it's definitely not there yet, especially as us on the East Coast can't even and do those things. But maybe in the future, the world will be different. So my next question for you is, where did you learn to grow cannabis? Obviously, this is a hobby that some of us have practiced in closets growing up and maybe in college. But where did you kind of really learn the, the skill? When I moved out to uh, Humboldt, um, I just I was lucky enough to have uh, some college buddies who we actually we all grew in our closets together, but who were out there doing it on a larger scale, and um, they invited me to come out. I don't, I yeah, eight or eight or nine years ago, like I said, and um, I it was all with the intentions of coming up here uh, once I went uh, recreational. But um, I, like I said, I started with a guy down there who'd been growing for God knows how long. 
uh, 30, 35 years. And he basically showed me on a real small scale how to grow organically, how to grow with salt. Um, and then we scaled it up to a nursery where I was just kind of in charge of um, cutting thousands of clones and caring for them and everything. And then we had a you know smaller like 50 light room and then added it to this and added to that and then um took care of some greenhouses and then that's when i met uh jesse who came up to washington with us who he had operated several like large farms um and i was able to take knowledge i learned on the small scale and then mix it with what he taught me on how to um really scale it <laughs> and that was kind of where it all just sort of clicked in together and that's that's where the methods were different the guy i learned from on the small scale did things way differently than uh, Jesse did on the large scale. And that's where like the pruning techniques and everything came in. Um, so, and it, it really, it was the only way we were really able to really keep it getting bigger and bigger. Um, I think it's uh, where a lot of people kind of hit their wall. Like you, you do a 30, 50, 100 light room and you know, you think you're the best, but then quadruple that and you have to kind of adjust. So I was pretty fortunate to have, I guess, be put in touch with people who really knew all aspects of it that I was able to learn it and take it to the scale that we're at. Let's talk about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. That's right. No more excuses. Get your lazy ass off the couch. Go start a podcast. There's the creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone with computer. Once again, no more excuses. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Could it be easier? Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's right. They're paying us for this ad. Thank you very much, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started now. Awesome. So this is obviously a very popular subject amongst our listeners. And for the listener question, there was obviously no doubt about which one this one was going to be. So Hans, what's the number one mistake you see home growers make? And what is the easiest way to get started growing at home? Well, uh, one, stay off the internet. Um, <laughs> I guess everybody wants to go and research everything off the internet and most of it's just kind of crap uh get yourself a book and by one of the old school guys and kind of just follow them step by step and that that'd be my advice that's how we always did it when we were doing our little closet grows but the biggest mistakes would kind of um honestly it, it's tough the the one of the biggest mistakes i always see people making on a any sort of scale if you're not used to plants is just overwatering. and it sounds silly but it's <clears throat> when the plant's a, a baby it's really hard to let it everybody thinks plants like water right so that my plant looks sad or it looks yellow or it looks this so i'm gonna hit it with some water um i hit it with some food i'm gonna and you just you overdo it um and that just that they can never recover from it so it's it's just one of those things that patience is kind of a virtue with it you gotta once you plant you just gotta leave it alone you gotta know when it needs to when it actually needs it you only want to give the plant what it needs when it needs it if you overdo it you will kill it it's kind of like force feeding your dog or something that'll just die. <laughs> so um, that that's like the number one mistake and the hardest thing that I have teaching people with a soil grow. Um, obviously, when you get into the more technical stuff, they have uh, moisture meters and computers that can do all that stuff for you. But for a little small home grow, that is number one. Just be patient. Make sure the plant needs to be watered, needs to be fed before you give it to it. And then on from there. I just want to take a quick moment for all the plants that I've killed over watering them. Just thinking about that, that is uh, very helpful. And I feel terrible knowing that I was the reason they didn't make it. But I, I mean, there's, if you, if you don't go on the internet and you want to learn kind of some of these, these tactics, you teaching any classes, Hans, any ideas in the future, maybe kind of one of those, those step-by-step -step, come learn how to grow cannabis at home. I mean, I, I would be open to it. Uh, not, nothing in the plans. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot of free time. But <laughs> I'd be, uh, I'm always, I'm always happy to help if someone asks. Um, I, like I said, I, the first thing I did when, uh, when we were growing in our closet and even when we got out to California was, uh, you, you know, you read the old books by, uh, Jorge Cervantes and those guys. Um, I disagree with a lot of the crap that they say, but they will give you the basic pointers on how to do everything. Um, and at, at least kind of hammer down the basics. So it's like, that's it, just the, the problem with online is get on your forums and you will read so much crap. That's just wrong. And you don't know who you're getting it from. You know what I mean? 
No, nah, that's the only reason. I tell everyone that I train or teach or anything. I'm like, if you have a question, call me. Do not get online. Um, we get online last if we really can't figure out what's going on. It's just there's just too too much call it misinformation. That's the popular word now, right? Um, so it's uh, I don't know. You guys want to put on a class? I'll I'll teach it for you. How's that sound? Oh, well, um, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, be careful what you say. This is a recorded podcast because we're going to drop that line really <laughs> quickly and see how many people we can get to sign up. But it might be a popular will, class, but who I'll, knows? Uh, I'll ha- happily we do, do like the master class or something. Exactly. Um, no, I, yeah, I, 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 have, I have no problem doing that at all. Um, I, I don't know how we do it because it's like, you know, it takes six months for the for the plane to go from seed or clone to finish but uh, i'm sure we can figure something out uh i'd be happy to have a weekly weekly clubhouse meetup hans there you go yeah i got the clubhouse let's do it hans what's your what's your favorite (laughs) we'll take care of all of it what's your favorite strain like what's your go-to what's your go-to if you're you're looking for some flour and is flour your your first choice Uh, like you're talking smoking or growing it Uh, yeah smoking it smoking it um yeah, if I uh, pretty pretty much, I, I'm like a I'm a you know a, a '70s smoker. I like to just smoke a joint here and there. I honestly don't smoke that much. Kellen can attest to that. I, uh, I I think once you surround yourself with nothing but weed all the time, like I, <laughs> it's, I don't want anything to do with it. But uh, uh, I I don't really have a favorite like strain per se. Um, I just like uh, I like the lighter stuff. I like the older school stuff. You like train wrecks stuff like that just stuff that's kind of just you get a little high but a little energetic so that i can you know go for a hike or something like that i am not a big fan of like the couch lock you know og strains or cookie strains stuff like that they just kind of i don't i don't move uh, I, I don't really like that anymore i used to um but that would be we got a strain here that our buddy brad called black afghani rose that that's probably one of my favorites of all time it's just uh it's real light and just kind of uplifting and you know i can work on it if i want to um that's yeah, probably one of my favorites strain. Uh, i know i love it yeah unfortunately you can't really buy it anywhere i don't think i don't think anybody has it anymore but but yeah that's one of my favorites there Hans. What's your favorite strain, yeah. or I guess what strain would you say does best indoor, outdoor, and in light depth? Um, well, okay, in my experience up here in Washington, at least, the indoor would probably be either that one, the BAR, or uh, we have another strain named Wonder Woman um, that just throws out just basically football-sized nugs and tests in like the mid to high 20s, um, finishes in eight weeks, and it's just you know kind of like what you're looking for. That one, so the depth houses are pretty similar to outdoor or to indoor uh, as far as yields and everything. That that was that one was still probably the best I've ever grown in a in a depth house. I actually got almost double the yield as any of the other things. But OGs are real good for that too. Uh, even the old Gorilla Glues stuff like that. Um, they they throw out pretty heavy yields. They just take a little longer. They go nine and a half weeks or so, so they get kind of rough. If you're trying to do a, a two depth system or anything. Um, and outdoor. So the thing about the outdoor is it really is like a fruit or something it i have strains up here that i grow that just absolutely crush it for me that i have buddies in cali that grow it and it does terribly and vice versa so um my personal favorite up here is it's a nine pound hammer it's like a, it's basically a cross the guy a buddy of mine same thing same guy i bred the bar he bred it calls it nine pound hammer number six Callan, i know you know that one it's still the best one we have by far um i we grew 95 strains last year and nothing nothing's even really close it just does perfect um just big 15 foot tall plants test high i think the last testing we did was 23 percent thc and that's for outdoor so it's pretty damn good and you know you're getting five six pounds of trim weed a plant it's just uh i can't finishes october 15th you know just like right right in the perfect little meaty part of the harvest so i uh i, I don't think there's anyone i will even compare to it to be honest with you yeah the the, the names is a whole nother the, the names is a whole nother game. And I um, mean, we could talk about that for, for days. Like h- how does one even come up with those names? Just kind of combining the two different strains and then just making a, a change. It's just that aspect kind of just blows my mind. There's, I don't, I am honestly bad with the strains. Uh, I know all like the old school ones. I know all the, I just get stuff. I don't even know where they come from at time anymore. I used to have all my logs of the crosses, the genetics, everything. And I just kind of, you know, it's uh, we're, when we're working down in California, it's, it's insane. I mean, there's uh, stuff I've never heard of. <laughs> it, it's, you know, and they're by far the best, most popular strain. And then you go down three months later and they're like, Oh yeah, that's old news. You know, like there's, 
uh, uh, what were they, uh, Gary Payton and cereal milk and like uh, all these other ones that they're that they're growing and the big famous brands are putting out and honestly I didn't even I couldn't keep up there's just too many so uh, yeah I think some of them are just like that they're just somebody who said oh I think it'd be cool to name a strain um, Tom Sawyer uh, and then the other ones are like you said it's usually just like a a cross back between you know whatever two different strains like chemo g or something like that you know and that's and they just keep it simple and call it that that's the easy way to go right so let's let's do prediction time kind of right around that topic cannabis is federally okay. legal we're all very excited things are good for us you go into a dispensary and you want to pick up flour are you buying it based on is it going to be the brand of the strain like how how do you think in the future, they'll have nationality brands with with products. How do you think that'll work, Hans? Personally, I think it'll work out like everything else, and it might take a long time because, especially with it going state state by state, and there being lots of different brands. But yeah, in 50, 60 years, you're going to have your Pepsi and your Coke and all type of stuff, and I'm going to be the curmudgeon old man telling my uh, nieces and nephews how the weed we used to smoke was so much better. <laughs> but that's just uh that's my pessimist side. I do think that there's always going to be, you know, like your, I think it'll be a lot like wine too, where you have your, um, or micro brews, even like, uh, you know, now micro brews become super popular and there's just kind of region by region. Some make it nationally. I think that'll be a big thing. I just, I think it'll be, uh, I do think that there'll be your Coors Light and your Miller Light and, uh, Coke, whatever, stuff like that for sure. But I, it, yeah, I, I, I hope that it's more of a, boutique market but i just it doesn't seem to work like that with much anything does it kellen your thoughts i agree with hans you know i think that uh the beer industry is probably a really good model that you could look at to kind of predict the cannabis space right um and i know like in humboldt uh when i was there i went to a town meeting and, and they had originally started the conversation about appalachians kind of how the grape and wine industry is and so there'll be pockets of of that aspect right from a wine connoisseur kind of product standpoint and comparative to the microbrew with your your fancy hazy ipas and your other other beers that they come out with um but at the end of the day i think the majority of consumer access is going to be dictated by a couple really large players and those really large players are just going to push their brands and own the retail space and it'll be the majority of what you see will be like the Miller Lite and the Coors Light or Pepsi and Coke, however you want to kind of make that comparison. What do you think, Brian? I don't, I don't really know, actually, because is Cureleaf going to own a certain strain? And then when you start bringing the location like you did into it, which might make it extremely attractive for some of the OGs to want certain types of a bud. I don't really know how that's going to work. I guess it'll be... Brand recognition, I think that's king in all the industries. And when people see a brand that they trust or that they know, they feel a sense of loyalty and a, and a sense of trust towards it. And I think as we get closer to brand nationalities and federal legalization, I think that'll be a really popular thing. Can I walk into a dispensary in California, get a specific type of product, and then come back into New York and buy the same product and have the same type of effect? We're probably a long ways away from that, but I, I wonder how they'll break it up and how that purchasing experience will really be. Yeah, it could be. It could go like kind of regional too. Like I know um, the, the the microbrew example. You know, in the Northwest, it's it's all it's everything. You know, you go to the you can just go to the grocery store and there's more. There's 150 different IPAs and Pilsners and everything that, and there's one little section with Miller Lite, Coors Light, Bud Light and an entire wall of microbrews. So they're just way more into them out here. Whereas where I'm from Chicago, it's the exact opposite. There's like, at least used to be anyway, maybe it's changed, but it, it, you've got all of your, your old style Miller Lite, all that stuff. And then there'd be like one little section with some microbrews. So it could be maybe in California, they don't, they don't give a damn about um, Cure Leaf or something like that, but they care about, you know, some little brand that grows boutique organic weed up in the mountains you know could end up being something like that i don't know i honestly hope that it's there's a emphasis on quality and it stays the way it is but yeah when the big guys get involved they just throw so much money at it and their their goal isn't to grow anything high end they don't care there there's just it's just money to them so it's just kind of pump it out fast and keep your costs down and i usually when they just keep throwing that at people for long enough it tends to work right 
Sure. And it's, it's funny that you say that. Cause I had that same experience out in Portland. I was like, this is the most small breweries I've ever seen in my entire life. Like where's the normal beers. I just want to grab like a 30 rack, but <laughs> <laughs> I wonder as we continue to evolve and Jay-Z selling like the $50 grams, right? I think consumers are going to kind of crave that specific grower. And I wonder if they become kind of like the chefs are today where people kind of idolize Gordon Ramsay and some of these other chefs from, from an individual standpoint and kind of seek out their different restaurants, whether you're in New Orleans or in California or in New York. And I wonder as the consumer kind of gets more educated, if they'll kind of seek out that same experience with master growers. I think they will. Uh, same thing, but that, but keep in mind, there's still Applebee's, you know, so, <laughs> so it's like, I, I think there'll be a market for it and there might be a bajillion dollar market. I just, um, I think the the odds are good. Most of when you go to the weed store, like the the biggest chunk of it'll be whatever you know, uh, cure med men or cure leaf or something like that, and it'll just be stamped on it. But I, I definitely think that there will be a, a large boutique market at least for a long time. I mean, weed has been kind of the reverse, right? I mean, the black market has even dictated quality. It's what, when I was in college and you'd be buying weed, it, like you you didn't want to buy any beasters or triple A's or any of that crap. You wanted like you know some kind of fire that came from wherever. You'd pay sixty bucks for it. Um, and now a lot of the like the weed that's on the shelves in states like that, the reason the black market's thriving is you can get better weed on the black market than you can in a store. So um, I'm hoping that it's going to kind of balance out to the, the point where there's at least a healthy mix and like, you know, where the, the kind of Miller Lite crap weed is just your cheap weed. And then you've got your high end stuff and your gray goose or, you know, whatever over here that people go and spend more money for. That's just how it should be. Right. Absolutely. Then the yeah. follow up question that we ask every single guest is when was the last time you consumed any cannabinoids? Uh, last night before I went to bed, I smoked a joint. Nice. Nice. Well, thanks for your time, Hans. And we look forward to selling out your first class of growing with Hans. <laughs> yeah, man. Let me know. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, I man. hope I was helpful. My name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.